Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And I wanted to tell you about one quick thing that David Farrow's actually has going on. And it's something I'm excited about because I think it's something you guys would be excited about. And yeah. If you guys have been enjoying the Neverglade mysteries like I have, because it's kind of my chance at doing some noir stuff, then you'll be happy to know that the book is available right now, both on digital and paperback. It's available on Amazon, and I actually have the links in the description down below. So, on to tonight's story, but if you want to continue seeing it, or get it straight from the source, check out the links. The wire led to a pipe on the smaller side, but large enough for a man to squeeze through, if you were so inclined. I had a sinking feeling that was the inspector's plan. He stuck his head into the pipe and peered silently into the darkness. It goes on for at least a mile, he said. The wire follows it all the way. I sighed. Fine. I guess we'll go spelunking. But if that thing bottlenecks when we're halfway through, I swear to God. The inspector ignored me. Slipping through the pipe and out of sight. I reluctantly followed him, chasing the speck of his cigar, which glowed a vivid orange in the otherwise pitch blackness. The water seeping through my mouth had a vague, sterile taste. I tried not to dwell on what kinds of chemicals I was ingesting. The pipe didn't bottleneck. As we swam, it sloped upward, the water going from chilly to lukewarm to uncomfortably hot. I was worried it was going to start boiling when a light suddenly appeared in front of us. The pipe widened into a wide open pool, and the inspector and I finally burst out of the water. I let out a gasp as the gills of my neck flapped shut and sealed back in a smooth skin. The inspector had already climbed out of the pool, still following the wire. I clambered after him, shaking the dampness out of my hair. The inspector's hoodoo had kept me from getting soaked, but I still felt a bit waterlogged. At least, at least I wasn't dripping onto the floor. The room we'd emerged in was pretty small aside from the pool, which stretched from wall to wall. Everything else was a tangle of machinery that looked way too advanced for a dummy like me. The wire wound around the tiles and ended in a console covered with buttons and switches. I drifted closer and saw that they were tiny TV screens embedded in the console. Most of them showed empty water. But on one, I very distinctly saw the dead carapace of the crab the inspector had killed. Ah, oh, crap. I breathed. They're watching us. They must have seen us run for help, the inspector said. Someone in here not too long ago. He pointed to a dark puddle on the floor where a coffee mug had fallen and shattered. A puddle was still steaming. Well, I vote that we get out of here, I said, before they come back. The inspector swept his eyes around the room and made a beeline for a plain white door I hadn't seen. We slipped out into a bright hallway with rows of blank doors and a checkered tile floor. Before I could look around too much, I heard the sounds of hurried footsteps approaching from around the corner. The inspector must have heard it too. He swept past me and hurried towards another door at the end of the hall. Together we burst through and into a sweeping open space that looked like a sleek hotel lobby, with huge windows forming a curved wall around us. The inspector and I ducked behind a reception desk, all seven feet of him somehow squeezed into that tiny space. We huddled there and listened for the approaching footsteps. They got closer. They got steadily louder. Then, a door opened, and the footsteps grew muted. I waited as long as I dared, then I poked my head over the desk. I could hear voices from some distant room, but otherwise, we were alone. I stood up to get a better look at the space, the inspector rising beside me. The lobby was filled with plush chairs and potted ferns. Through the enormous windows, I saw a long stretch of pavement, surrounded by grass and ending in a metal gate. It occurred to me suddenly that we were in a totally unfamiliar and potentially dangerous place with no exit route. I grabbed my cell phone, which had somehow survived the dunk in Lake Lucid, and checked the GPS. Assuming my phone's circuits hadn't been scrambled, we were standing in a nameless building on the edge of the lake, a few miles under the Catamount Forest. I dialed Marconi's number and held the phone up to my ear. Hagen? She said, picking up on the third ring. Shh, I whispered. I'm in a tight spot, Marconi. I need an escape plan. Can you take a cruiser and meet me in these coordinates in 15 minutes? I told her where we were, and I heard a pencil scratching as she scribbled it down. Hey, Hannigan, she said suddenly. It's not like you to run off into a crazy mission without me. Is... is he with you? He glanced over at the inspector. Yeah, uh, there's a whole story here, but I... I don't have the time to tell it now. Just meet me where I told you. You got it, detective, she said and the phone went silent. I tucked it in my pocket and turned to the inspector. Come on, I said. We got 15 minutes. Let's figure out what this place is and get the hell out of here. The inspector lifted a slender finger and pointed to a series of 
gilded letters on the wall above us. I spun around and backed up a bit. The words were a metallic gold. It seemed to glimmer, even though there was no moonlight. Climate Association for the Pacific Regional Area. The subsidiary of Rosencorp. Climate Association, I said. Why do I get the feeling that's a front for something far more sinister? Because it probably is, the inspector said. Come on, let's go further in. We snuck through the lobby and down a nondescript hallway. Door after door stretched out as far as I could see. I tried the first one, but it was locked, of course. The inspector stepped forward and made a clicking sound with his teeth. Something inside the lock imitated the sound, and the door cracked open. Now, you're just full of surprises, aren't you? I said. The room inside was pretty much your standard laboratory fare, although it was dark and I couldn't make out much except for a few spindly microscopes. The next room was largely the same, and the next, and the next, and for a minute I thought we wouldn't find anything remotely incriminating. Then I opened one door and found myself staring at a storage room full of wooden boxes. Stamped across each of them were the words CAUTION. Explosives. Well, the inspector said, that's a bit concerning. Yeah, you're telling me. I closed the door. We pressed onwards, creeping through corridor after corridor, passing more locked doors and the occasional bit of wall decoration, mainly landscape portraits and pictures of nameless figures in lab coats. At one point, we passed an aquarium filled with lazily drifting rainbow fish. A few corners past the aquarium, the hall ended in a set of opposing double doors, marked with yellow warning signs that practically shouted employees only. I drew closer to them cautiously. The inspector drifted ahead of me and lifted a head up to the window. A loud sound ripped through the air. I can only describe it as a vorp. The inspector was suddenly blasted forward. The projectile singed my cheeks as it whooshed by. I clapped my hands to the searing skin, wincing. A thought filled my head. Ah, that's gonna leave a mark. But right then, I had more pressing concerns than a little burn. I watched helplessly as the inspector's body flew through the air, struck the double doors, and exploded into a thousand tiny purple particles. No! I screamed. The air crackled around me. I turned to see a very large, very deadly-looking weapon held inches from my temple. It was a gun, straight out of some sci-fi flick, with a long chrome barrel and a yellow orb at the tip that sparkled with bursts of electricity. The woman holding it looked around my age, although her cheeks were lined with premature wrinkles. She wore glasses, a white lab coat, and had a mane of long blonde hair tied back into a ponytail. A single golden hair curled across her forehead like a question mark. About a dozen men in armored black suits and faceless masks stood behind her, holding assault rifles that looked far less sci-fi, but no less deadly. I suggest you come with me, the woman said in a rather husky voice. Our tall friend will probably piece himself together again, but something tells me you won't be as successful on scrambling your atoms. Her finger tightened on the trigger, and the crackling intensified. Drop your weapon, put your hands behind your head. I bent over cautiously placed my pistol on the tiles. I mean, what choice did I have? I straightened up, hands raised, resting my palms on the back of my head. One of the marked men hurried forward and snatched the gun from the ground. After a few tense seconds, the woman lowered her weapon a fraction. Turn around and walk through those doors, she said. Do exactly as I tell you and your safety is guaranteed. If you try to escape or do anything else funny, I won't hesitate to fire this thing Do I make myself clear. Clear as crystal. I muttered. My burnt cheek throbbed as she nudged me forward with the tip of her gun. Hands still behind my head, I walked as slowly as I dared towards the set of double doors. Each footstep clacked on the tiles like panes of breaking glass. I reached the door and pushed through them with my shoulder, emerging in a dimly lit hall lined with windowless doors. Third door on the right, the woman said. Step inside, don't move a muscle. I'll be right behind you the entire time. I did as she said and approached the door. The yellow warning sign plastered across it did little to ease my already churning stomach. I turned the handle, pushed it open, and walked inside. Fluorescent lights in the ceiling flickered on as I entered. Despite the ominous sign out front, the room looked like any other fairly nondescript science lab, complete with beakers and microscopes and an equation-riddled whiteboard. A large circular shape in the corner sat hidden under a gray blanket. You two stand guard over here. I heard the woman say. The rest of you, spread out. If there's any more intruders around here, they won't get far. There was a shuffle as the masked man did as she instructed, and then the woman was in the room with me, closing the door behind her. The only sound was the crackle of her laser gun. She kept it trained on me as she circled around the room, her eyes sharp and blue behind those thin glasses. 
Neither of us spoke for several seconds. Then her shoulders relaxed and she let out a breathy laugh. I didn't move. Not even when she powered down the gun, placed it on the counter, and approached me with an outstretched hand. Every muscle in my body sensed a trap. Sorry for the theatrics, but we can't be too careful, she said. I know who you are, Detective Hannigan. I've heard all about you. It's a thrill to finally meet you face to face. She gestured for me to take her hand and smiled. I'm Valentina Coppell. I run this facility. I didn't shake her hand, but I did lower my arms. Her smile was earnest. Her eyes had softened. But just a second ago, she had me at blaster point, so pardon me if I had trust issues. Theatrics? I echoed at last. You blew up my friend. You call that theatrics? Valentina's fingers curled up. He'll be fine, she said. The inspector's a big boy. It'll take more than an atom blaster to keep him down for long. She turned around, strode to a lab stool, and took a seat, her legs crossed. Which is why we don't have much time to talk. I'm not sure what you think I'd have to say. But Jesus Christ, you blew him up, don't you get that? I don't care if he'd glue himself back together. What makes you think I'm going to get all buddy-buddy with someone who blows up my friends? I needed to speak with you, she said with an infuriating calmness. And there's no chance of that happening with him around. So I removed him, temporarily. You're blowing this way out of proportion. Am I? I said. I took a step toward her. Why don't you tell that to the eight people who just killed themselves because of the contaminated lake water? Or those, those campers who got their juices sucked out by the Wendigo because both of those scenarios had your ugly stamp on them. Kind of hard to fake innocent when you leave behind a, a calling card. Valentina was quiet. For a second, I thought I'd stumped her. But she simply uncrossed her legs and sighed as if she was disappointed in me. Why would I want to fake innocent? She said. I'm proud of what we've accomplished in Pacific Glade. Do you know we were the first humans on the entire planet to find tangible evidence of another world? Even better, the first to make contact with life on the other side. It's not always intelligent. It's not always benevolent. We learn more with every experiment. Soon we may be even able to cross the rift ourselves. You don't want to do that. I blurted out before I could stop myself. Valentina raised an eyebrow. The smile that had dimmed returned, this time a fraction wider. She reached into the pocket of her lab coat and withdrew a tiny tablet computer. Her fingernails clacked furiously as she began to type. Of course, she said. I forgot you've been behind the rift, detective. What was it like? Was it populated? Was their world like ours? Or was the environment utterly alien? Tell me as much as you remember. It was purple. Everything was the same, except purple. Wait, why am I telling you this anyway? I don't have to tell you anything. Valentina looked up from her tablet. Of course you don't. But I think you will. You have a lot to learn from each other, Detective, and it would be in your best interest to think of me as an ally. I can offer you resources, information, weapons, technology. That would aid you in your investigations. My investigations, I said. A skeptical laugh escaped my mouth. You mean the investigations you were responsible for? There wouldn't have been any cases to look into if you and your corporate goons hadn't invited monsters to town. Valentina frowned. You don't think we brought them all here, do you? Reality is thin in the Glade. Sometimes things get through. Sometimes we deal with them. Other times we welcome them. We try to learn from them. Everything we do is in the pursuit of knowledge and understanding. I fail to see how killing a whole bunch of civilians fits into this mission statement of yours, I said. She pursed her lips and crossed her legs again. The collateral damage was regrettable, she said. But any scientific advances of this scale require some sacrifice. We learned a great deal from the entity in the radio waves before it went haywire. It, it told us about the empathic giants and how they can naturally cross between dimensions. It told us how, how to challenge the power of the rift and enhance human ability. Most of the test subjects don't last. But we achieved tremendous success with one Marcy McKenna. I believe you knew her. I have no idea who you're talking about. Valentina looked surprised and laughed. <laughs> no, I, I suppose you wouldn't. What the hell are you even trying to accomplish here? I asked. Whatever's behind the rift isn't interested in making friends. They're cruel and they're hungry and think we're all insects. Best case scenario, they kill you fast. 
better than having your body hijacked or your life force slowly sucked out through your brain. But don't you see, detective? Making friends is exactly what you've done. She leaned forward and something glinted in her eye. How else would you describe this rapport you have with the inspector? I faltered. I hated to admit it, but she actually had a point there. She balanced on the edge of her stool, shoes dangling idly above the tiles. The inspector is an exception, I said at last. He's a missing link. The bridge between us and that world. If we can work with him, there's no limit to the things we can learn. Her excitement was growing, her eyes lighting up. Just think. Think of what we could accomplish with a being like that at our side. You don't know anything about him, I said. He's never going to help you, not after what you've done. Valentina settled back against the counter. No, probably not. Which is why we need you, Detective Hannigan. Come again. Observe him. Share his knowledge with us. Tell us about his powers, his weaknesses. Learn what you can about him and the world he comes from. No piece of information is too small, too insignificant. I'm not being your double agent, I spat. Oh, this isn't about loyalty, she said, frowning. This is about what's best for this town, for the entire human race. What's best for this town, I echoed. What an absolute crock of crap. Was it good for the town when your radio monster melted people's brains? How about those people who killed themselves because you placed a, a hallucinatory monster at the bottom of the lake? Those were my neighbors. Those are my friends. They didn't deserve what they got. I took in a shaky breath and clenched my fists. You're putting the entire Glade in danger. And for what? Science? This isn't science. This is a slaughter. The problem, she said calmly, is that you're not seeing the larger picture here. Our research is not theoretical. We know the rift is dangerous. And we know that one day, maybe tomorrow, maybe in a month, maybe in a thousand years, something will come through that threatens everything we've ever known. And when that day comes, we must be prepared. She peered at me above the rim of her glasses. Sometimes, lives get lost in the name of progress. This is nothing new. I thought you, as a cop, would understand that much. I was silent for a moment. The clock ticked somewhere in the background. The masked guards shuffled their feet outside the door. I mulled over her words and stared at the, the blanket-covered object in the corner. Yeah. Yeah, I've killed people as a cop, I said quietly. It's a tragedy every time. That's a family missing a father, a mother, a child. Someone's story coming to an end, and even... Even if it's necessary, even if it means saving my life or the, the lives of the people around me, it still hurts. They all mean something to me. Not just, not just data on a spreadsheet. Valentina said nothing. She sat utterly still on the lab stool, looking at me as if she'd, she'd never seen anything stranger in her entire life. If you don't help us. We have to continue observing the inspector from afar, and that means more monsters, more pointless deaths, more tragedy. Will you be able to live with yourself knowing that on some level, all that blood is on your hands? I gritted my teeth. You. Don't, don't try to twist this around and blame this on me. I stopped. The room had suddenly started to rumble like a train was going on on the other side of the wall. I reached out and grabbed the closest counter. Valentina looked up at the ceiling, alarmed, as flecks of plaster came loose and sprinkled around her like snowflakes. Damn it, she muttered. I thought we'd have more time. The air in the center of the room suddenly contracted, warping the tables and chairs and creating a loud sucking sound. Bits of purple goo spat out of the center of the contraction and floated in the air like they'd struck an invisible wall. Valentina and I watched as this gunk condensed on itself, growing mass, becoming long and thin and sprouting outstretched limbs. My heart leapt as the goo molded into a trench coat and a wide-brim fedora. Still purple. Still dripping. 
but unmistakable. Valentina's eyes were fixed on the newly reformed inspector. I took advantage of the distraction and ran forward, snatched her blaster from its spot on the counter. Valentina jumped up and fumbled for the gun. I darted backwards out of the reach, training the barrel at her chest. I flicked a switch on the side and the tip began to crackle with the yellow lightning. Make a move, I breathed. I dare you. She froze in place, and she stared at me. She didn't look scared or angry, just curious, as if she wanted to see what I'd do. I tightened my grip on the handle and glanced at the blob that was the inspector. He'd started to shed the blanket of purple goo, gray skin exposed on his face and hands. His feet touched down on the floor of the lab, his coat dripped in violet puddles on the tile as he turned his head and stared at Valentina. The cigar was back, and curls of hot red smoke issued from his mouth. Inspector, I said, you made it back in one piece. The tall figure said nothing, did nothing, only stared at Valentina with rage burning quietly in his eyes. I didn't like her in the slightest, but I didn't exactly want the inspector to splatter her guts across the walls, or whatever else he was capable of. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> we should go, I said. Leave her for now. We can, we can deal with her later. The inspector didn't speak, but he nodded slowly. Good enough. I figured we could probably muscle past the guards if necessary, but I had a laser gun in my hands, and it would be a waste not to use it. I turned the barrel to the door and tightened my finger on the trigger. The device let out a low hum like a nest of cicadas before letting out another ear-splitting vort. Unleashing a blast of light. The door utterly disintegrated, leaving behind a jagged circular hole. Through it, I saw two guards slumped on the floor, apparently having been blasted into the far wall. They looked burnt and unconscious, but otherwise alive. Come on, I said, scrambling through the hole. We didn't exactly have the element of surprise, but we did have an atom blaster, so I guess it sort of balanced out. The inspector glided past me and made a beeline for the double doors. I followed him, but not before shooting a glance back at Valentina. She was still perched on her stool, although she had a tablet in her hands, and I was sure she had already called for backup. Her eyes locked on mine. The whole meeting clearly hadn't gone as she intended, but even so, she didn't look upset or even disappointed. It looked like she was thinking, like she was already circulating what the next move would be. I didn't like that look, so I turned away and I ran after the inspectors retreating back, even as the halls lit up with red alarms, even as sirens began to blare like foghorns in my eardrums. It was only a matter of time before the guards in black would be on us. But I had this big gun, and I had the inspector, and maybe that would be just enough to make it through the onslaught unscathed. I just hoped Marconi was waiting for us on the outside. The first wave of guards hit us right as we were passing the aquarium. They came pouring out of hidden doorways, visors pulled low, lethal-looking rifles clutched in their hands. One of them barked a command to stop, but the inspector didn't even hesitate. He ripped the cigar from his lips and flicked it at the glass. The tip blared briefly, then exploded. Water came gushing through the hole along with a deluge of brightly colored fish. The guards were knocked off their feet and swept down the lengthy hallway, swearing as they did so. The water rushed towards us, but instead of knocking us over, it broke into two waves and missed us completely. The inspector stood impassively between the walls of water. As I watched, the cigar shot back to him like a boomerang and planted itself firmly in his mouth. Nice trick, Moses, I said. Let's get the hell out of here. We hurried through the halls, ducking around the corner as another set of guards rushed past. My fingers itched on the atom blaster, but I was reluctant to actually fire the thing at a human being. Plus, there was no guarantee it was even powered up after that long discharge. The orb at the tip was still crackling, but I thought the sound was a bit dimmer than it had been before. The inspector lifted his head and beckoned for me to follow him. We moved through the halls as fast as we dared. At one point, we ran past a large set of glass doors, and I skidded to a halt, staring at what lay beyond them. The doors were bolted shut, but they led outside. A small stretch of ground jutted from the threshold and ended in a helipad. Sitting pretty on the pavement was a sleek black helicopter. Inspector, I asked. I asked, stopping him. Look, my father-in-law taught me how to fly one of those things. It was ages ago, but still, I could probably pilot that baby out of here. The inspector looked outside and frowned. The smoke gushed from his cigar, an alarming shade of yellow. Sheriff Marconi is waiting for us, he rasped. Maybe his vocal cords hadn't fully reformed yet. If we take another route of escape, they'll find her. Don't forget that she's been beyond that rift, too. She's just as valuable to them as you are. I hesitated, but not for long. The inspector was right. 
I hefted the blaster and hurried past the glass doors, leaving the helipad behind. The lobby was miraculously empty, but when we burst through the front doors and dashed out to the pavement, we found ourselves suddenly faced with a squad of army men. I skidded to a halt and whirled around, but now the lobby was swimming with guards. They spilled through the doors and surrounded us on all sides. I felt my heart sink as I whipped the blaster back and forth. I could probably take out a swath of them, but there were way too many to handle with just one weapon. It would only take one well-placed bullet to drop me. Put the gun down and put your hands up, barked one of the masked men. Enough of this, the inspector muttered. He raised his hands, palm up, and clenched his fists. At once, the ground erupted. A solid column of dirt and grass shot from the cracks on the pavement and barreled into the first line of guards, sending them flying. The rest of them immediately opened fire on the inspector. He threw himself onto the ground as the bullets whizzed over my head and sank into the inspector's body like putty. Unmoved and unhurt, he swung his arms to the right and took out another dozen guards with a second column of earth. They cried out in pain and surprise, and I watched as they flew through the air and struck the ground, moaning. Now, Mark, the inspector shouted. Startled, I got clumsily to my feet and swung the blaster towards the facility gate. Only two guards were left standing, but they paled when they saw the weapon in my hands. I thumbed the button on the side and set the tip a crackle with a yellow lightning. Move or I blast you, I said shakily. I'm not gonna ask twice. I checked my finger on the trigger. The weapon's hum grew louder, and the guards, apparently deciding they wanted to live another day, threw themselves aside. The blast escaped my gun and slammed into the gate, disintegrating it on impact. The inspector strode forward at once. He glided through the gaping hole, dirt and pebbles still swirling around his feet. I gripped a smoking gun and hurried after him. The inspector sped up once more when we were past the gate, and I quickened my pace as well, shooting a nervous glance behind me. Wouldn't take long for the guards to get back on their feet and come after us. We had a head start. They had more men and more guns. Our only chance of escape hinged entirely on Marconi. We ran down a crude stretch of pavement into the heart of the forest. My heart was pounding and I cursed myself for not staying in better shape. Just when I thought I couldn't run any further, the rumble of an engine rose suddenly from the forest and a police cruiser with dark headlights appeared. The car skidded to a halt in front of us and kicked up a cloud of dirt. Get in! Marconi shouted. The inspector and I leapt into the back seat and swung the door shut, just as a bullet zoomed through the trees and shattered the window. A few more bullets thunked into the side of the cruiser, but Marconi was already peeling rubber in the other direction, headlights glaring. I clutched my seat as we rocketed down the road. The car rumbled like a washing machine as it drove over the uneven gravel. Jesus, Hannigan, Marconi called back to me. How did you always get yourself into the deepest crap? I didn't answer. I could hear shouting and a few more bursts of gunfire, but now it sounded like we were gaining distance. And then I remember the helicopter. I turned my eyes to the night sky, squinting for any black shape hidden in all that darkness. If they were following us by air, they were well hidden. I couldn't see anything in the sky except a few stars struggling to poke through the dense layer of clouds. Let's get back into town, I said finally. They don't want us getting away. I have a feeling they won't follow us into the glade. A bunch of civilians getting an eyeful of their massed army would totally blow their cover. And I'm curious as to who they are. Why they want to put a bullet in UT so bad, Marconi said. Get talking, Hannigan. So I walked through what we had seen in the facility. What Valentina Coppell had told me. Marconi listened without saying a word. The inspector didn't seem to hear a thing I was saying. His eyes were turned towards the shattered window, lost and distracted. I peered through the hole with him. In the distance, I thought I saw a long bungalow-type structure, partially hidden by the trees. Was that the Capra headquarters? I stared at the low shape and wondered what kind of strange science was going on inside. I knew so little about the organization, what it really was after. Valentina had said an awful lot in that lab, but in the end, she hadn't told me much at all. It was well past midnight when I finally got home. But a light was still on in one of the downstairs windows. I opened the front door with some apprehension. Valentina beat me here, I thought absurdly. But as I crossed the kitchen quietly and peered into the den, I saw Rory curled up on the couch, reading a comic book by lamplight. Hey, sport, I said. Rory jumped up and immediately dropped the comic. His eyes were bleary. I noticed. Like he'd been fighting sleep until I came home. I sat down next to him and patted him on the knee. What you doing up? I asked. Gonna be hurting at school tomorrow if you don't get to bed. Rory was quiet for a moment. 
Then he put aside his comic and said, I couldn't sleep. I keep thinking about Grandpa. I'd been so preoccupied with psychic crabs and shadowy organizations I'd almost forgotten that this whole investigation had begun. Rory didn't look weary from the sleep. He looked world-weary. It was a strange expression to see on a 12-year-old. But what we saw at Grandpa's funeral... I, you don't have to be. I have a feeling we're done seeing ghosts around here. But Rory shook his head. I'm not worried about that, he said, like the idea was stupid. I just keep thinking about the last time I saw him. He came over on Easter. He told us he told us stories about when he was growing up, you know, outside the glade. They were really good stories. They're just dumb. But... Uh, I want to hear more of his stories. But I know I can't. I keep thinking, like... I knew him, but I, I didn't really know him, you know, and... And now I, I, I won't ever know him. Not really. I pulled Rory into a tight hug. He let out one tiny sob, but was otherwise quiet. I held him close and I patted his back and I thought about what I'd told Valentina. How every death was a story ending. A book being closed for good. Rory understood that now, in ways Valentina and her scientists never could. We stayed up for another hour or so, curled up on the couch, sharing stories about Peter and what we remembered of him. Eventually, Rory's eyes drooped, and I laid his head gently on the cushion. And then I shuffled upstairs, opening my bedroom door and sliding under the covers. Ruth's hands closed around mine. I nestled up against her, comforted by her warmth, by her steady presence. Together, we slipped into sleep. Every life is a story. You never know how many pages are left in ours, so we bookmark moments to come back to. That night with Rory, that moment of closeness with Ruth, those were some of my bookmarks. And when the pages finally ran out, when my story reached its peak, those were the moments I clung to. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to say thank you for watching tonight's video. If you guys really liked today's video, feel free to check me out at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. A bunch of you already did, like Tacia Lynn, Gino Baga Arneo, Eric Mary, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Said El Yassin, Buddy Burrows, Tyler Ramberg, Goonington, G. Weevil 3, Diane Krauss, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Melissa Swagart, Chumpinski, Daniel Rao, The Ginger Bros, Robert Ramirez, Andrew Stenberg, Holy Realm, Ralph Rodriguez, and Dr. Strawberry. A very special thank you to you guys for being the top supporters on Patreon, and honestly, any support at all is really appreciated. So if you're watching on YouTube, listening to the podcast on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, or Google Play, or I guess anywhere you can manage to find a podcast. A huge thank you to you guys as well. Oh, also, if you want to help support my wife, she runs a tea shop over on Etsy. Etsy.com slash Ivory Monocle. She actually does Dungeons and Dragons themed stuff, but she just started doing a Final Fantasy and Harry Potter tea set, so that might be something you'd like on a dark and stormy night. Sweet dreams, kids. <laughs>